Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, number four, and uh, then we can head for home. Okay, for those of you out on television, that just means it's the fourth program we've made this afternoon. And uh, if ever you're traveling through Tulsa on a Wednesday, call us and uh, don't need tickets. We usually have room enough for everybody that comes, so come and join us. Okay, we're just an informal Bible study, and we just simply look at what the book says, and uh, if, if it's not scriptural, and I have an idea, hopefully I always put it that way, that this is the way I think, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily 100%. So always remember, I try to show everything from what the scripture says. Uh, I guess I've, I should just never fail. I just can't fail thanking our television audience for the response that uh, keeps us on the air. You know, a lot of people would probably look at this humble background and uh, without a lot of flowers and a lot of fluff and pomp and circumstance and wonder how in the world do you stay on television? In fact, they do. They'll ask. Uh, well, maybe this is what people want. So uh, we do. We, we keep it plain and simple. And uh, I think I've gained my trademark short sleeve shirt. And uh, in one of our conferences last week, a guy said, now Les, whatever you do, don't go up there with a suit and tie. They won't know who you are. <laughs> so uh, this is my trademark. All right, enough of that. Let's go right back. I was going to continue on in Isaiah, Jerry, but I changed my mind over the break. <laughs> I just can't do it yet. Come back with me to Revelation again. We're still going to be looking at this kingdom concept. <clears throat> Because when there is so much opposition to it, then I guess it's worth four programs to try to refute the opposition. Revelation, chapter 20. Revelation, chapter 20. Starting right at verse 1. Now this, of course, is at the ending hours of the tribulation. And the battle of Armageddon has just been fought. Christ against the Antichrist and his armies. All right, now chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. Now, it's not necessarily an iron chain, but it's a chain of something that will confer, uh, confine an angelic being, such as Satan. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him... How long? A thousand years. All right, but now just see how often Scripture repeats this number, 1,000 years. All right, uh, come on down to verse 3. Cast him into the bottomless pit, shuts him up, sets a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until, that's a time word, the thousand years are fulfilled. Now there's twice in two verses that it's a thousand years. After that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, a lot of people wonder. I'll just have to stop. <clears throat> a lot of people write, why? After we got that rascal tied up, and he's off the scene, he's not hurting anybody, why does God bring him back? Well, you see, it's a dispensational thing. Every dispensation God gave mankind. Let's just start with Adam and Eve in the garden. A simplest of the dispensation, which is a time during which God lays a responsibility upon the human race, and when they fail it, judgment falls, and something else brings about a new dispensation. All right, let's start with Adam and Eve. It was a dispensation. They were in the Garden of Eden, and they only had one responsibility, not to eat of that one tree. That was the only thing. Everything else was theirs to enjoy. But along comes old Satan, the deceiver, and what does he say? Hath God really said? Well, what's he doing? He's planting doubt. All right, then he comes along and says, well, now it's all well and good that you've got this glorious environment. You're in a special place. But instead of being under God, wouldn't you rather be like Him or above Him? Now, do you get that? That is the lie of Scripture. 
when Satan convinces the human race that they can become something better and above God. All right, Eve fell for it because it sounded so good. Well, yeah, we've got it good, but to have it even better, why not? All right, now it's going to be the same thing at the end of these thousand years. They've had it just as good for a thousand years as Adam and Eve had in the garden for however long they were there. So what does God have to prove? That after 7,000 years, the human makeup has not changed. And you want to remember that you're starting the thousand years with just a small percentage of true believers, flesh and blood, Gentile parents, Jewish parents. All right, now all these new generations that come over a period of a thousand years, now that's a lot of people from Israel and from the world in general. They're still flesh and blood just like we are today. They're still born with the Adamic nature just like we are today. And they've enjoyed all these good things for a thousand years. But it's a dispensation. They have to be tested. Well, how do you test someone? Give them an alternative. So who alone can give an alternative to what God has blessed them with? Satan. And so God lets Satan come back to test these new generations of people. Will they hold true to the king after all his goodness toward them? Or are they going to fall for the lie that they can be like God or above him? Well, now let's just see what happens. All right? So he must be loosed a little season to give these new generations of human beings a choice. Satan's lie or God's goodness? All right, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they who sat upon them, and judgment or rule was given unto them. I saw the souls of them who were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, that is, back during the tribulation. <clears throat> Neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right? Now verse 5. But the rest of the dead, now that's the unbelieving element of humanity, they live not until the thousand years are finished. And this bringing out the lost of the ages before the great white throne and then consigning them to their doom that is the second death. This which the believers have enjoyed is the first resurrection. All right, now when you go into verse 6, blessed and holy is he who hath part in the first resurrection. Those are believers. The first great group of believers will be the church age. And of course, I think you got those who came out of the tombs in Matthew 27. But the major resurrection day is what we call the rapture of the church. And all the believers in the church age are resurrected. Then Daniel chapter 12 brings in the resurrection of the Old Testament believers, which will be 75 days after the kingdom starts. So now you've got all the believers, Old Testament, New Testament, tribulation. They've all been resurrected into heavenly bodies fit for eternity. But the lost, you see, are still where? They're waiting down in hell, as we call it. Now i got to take you back. See, I didn't intend to do this. This is free for nothing. John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 5. Yeah, John's Gospel, chapter 5. Drop down to verse 28. This is during Christ's earthly ministry. <clears throat> so if you have a red letter edition, it's in red. Jesus is speaking. Y'all got it? John 5, verse 28. Now we got to establish who are in that second resurrection or the second death. Verse 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves, every human being who has ever lived and died, will hear his voice, and they shall come forth. Now here's where we separate them. They who have done good, or the people of faith, 
they will come to the resurrection of life, eternal life. They who have done evil, they've remained in their unbelief, they will come to the resurrection of condemnation, to their doom. All right, now let's come back to Revelation chapter 20 again. Because you've got unbelievers who have died ever since. I usually go back to Cain, who I think was the first lost person. And everybody that's rejected God's salvation all the way up through human history until we get to this great white throne judgment after the millennium has run its course. All right, so jump back in with me again at Revelation 20. The believing element who have been resurrected will live and reign with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, the lost, who were not yet resurrected, they live not again until the thousand years are finished. Now this next statement jumps back up into verse 4, the first resurrection. Consequently, verse 6 can say, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such, these are the true believers, the second death, which is the consignment to the eternal doom, the second death hath no power because they're believers. And they shall be priests of God in Christ and reign with him, here it is again, a thousand years. Now verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, they've run their course. In time as we know it, the same planet, rejuvenated, remodeled, regenerated, reconstituted, however you want to put it, but it's still going to have the sun rising in the morning and setting at night. It's still going to be an earth of production of food and fruit and so forth. All right, so when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison, and he'll go out and deceive. See, there's the word. He'll go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, why? Well, he's going to convince them that if they follow him, they can be like God. They're going to defeat him. We'll just declare war on him, and we'll throw him out. You know, I always have to wonder about Satan. Don't you? How ignorant he must be, and yet so powerful and wise but to always think from day one that he could defeat God? He never seems to get over it. So here again, he will convince these multitudes to follow him, and they actually, now evidently, this will be a fairly long period of time. They're going to be able to put together military equipment, and they go up with a warfare to compass the camp of the saints, which is Jerusalem, the beloved city, but God doesn't fight them with tanks and guns. He comes supernaturally with fire from God out of heaven and devours them, just simply consumes them. All right, the devil now is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the false prophet and the Antichrist already are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what the book says. It's not my idea. I know it's a horrible thing to think of, but the scripture teaches it. All right, now here comes the great white throne, and here come the lost of all the ages who will be resurrected out of their waiting place in hell where they go now. God will resurrect them out, give them a body fit for the, great, uh, for the lake of fire, and brings them up before the great white throne where Christ is now sitting as the judge, not the Savior. All right, and so John sees the dead, small and great, of the lost, stand before God. And the books, the record books, were opened. Another book, the book of life, was opened. And the dead, the lost, were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's why hell will have degrees of punishment. And every detail of a lost person's life will be brought up before him. And God is keeping a record. All right, then when you come up to 
verse 13, the sea gives up the dead. In other words, all the lost of all the ages will be brought up to the great white throne, and they were judged, every man according to their works. Now then, verse 14, and death and hell, from which these people have been resurrected, were cast into the lake of fire. Now, people don't like that, and I don't either, but it's true. And I don't know how else to put it. We, we, have, we have, all of us, we've become so blasé. Well, they're lost. They're going to hell. You know, I, I read an analogy years ago, and it has always stuck. If you were driving down the street of your hometown or your own neighborhood, and you saw a person's house on fire that you knew intimately, and you knew they had three or four kids sleeping in the upstairs bedroom. And if you were to drive by about midnight and you saw the flames coming out of the upstairs windows, what would you do? Would you just drive on home and go to bed? Why, no human being could. We would do whatever we could to get the fire departments or to go and knock the door down to wake them up and get them out. Every one of us would. But when it comes to the eternal, they're going to an eternal lake of fire, and we don't even blink an eye. Well, I don't know what to do about it, but that's the sad story of the human race. And it's not going to be an instant annihilation like a lot of people like to think. The Scripture is adamant. It's going to be forever and ever and ever. And the worst part of it will not be the flame. Now, you know some of the liberals referred to Reagan after his funeral about four or five days that he was already a toasty brown. What a horrible way to refer to. You read it. Unbelievable. But see, that's just the way they are. But the lake of fire is real. It's coming for lost humanity. And then it says, verse 15, 14 and 15, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death because the first death was when they died physically. This is a spiritual separation from God. Now verse 15, so whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Well, it means what it says and it says what it means. But we don't like to think of that. And I can't blame you. I don't. But nevertheless, it's the teaching of Scripture that the lost will be consumed in the, or not consumed, consigned is the word I wanted. They'll be consigned to the lake of fire for all eternity as we will be consigned to eternal life for all eternity. All right, now then, I established the thousand years, right? Now let's come back to Hosea. I kind of tantalized you with it back in the first program, but now we'll look at it. Come back with me to Hosea. Right after the book of Daniel. Find your major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. The next one is Hosea, and jump in with me at chapter 5. A couple interesting verses. Not many people are aware of them. A few are, but not many. Hosea 5, last verse. Hosea chapter 5, verse 50. All right, I will go and return to my place. Now, who does that sound like? The Lord, Christ. When he says, I will go, where is he speaking from? Heaven. Where is he going? To the earth. And then what's he going to do? He's going to return at the ascension, see? All right, so I will go and return to my place. And how long is he going to stay there, seated at the Father's right hand? Until they, who are the they? Israel, acknowledge their offense. What was their offense? The crucifixion, the rejection. And they will finally recognize it, see? And they will seek my face in their affliction. Now, what's the affliction he's talking about? The tribulation. That's the whole purpose of it, is God's wrath upon Christ rejecting Israel and the world in general. We're not going to put the Jews in the solitary place of that. But it's primarily God dealing with his covenant people. All right, in their affliction, they, the nation of Israel, will seek me 
early. Now come down to chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return unto the Lord. Now what does that sound like who's speaking? Israel. Israel is now speaking. Come, let us return to the Lord. My, they've got something to return from, see? For he hath torn, and he will heal us. Now, in our present day, he hath torn. You know what I immediately think of? The bus bombings in Israel. My, after one of those horrendous suicide bombings, special people volunteer to go down and scrape up the body parts beyond human comprehension. It happens all the time. Scraping up the body parts that have been blown asunder. Well, that's what I have to feel here. Oh, they're being torn asunder. But, he says, he will heal us. Who will? Israel's Messiah. He hath smitten. Of course he has. But he will bind us up. Now, here comes the interesting part. Verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. Now, I'm not going to take you back to what does First Peter say. A thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years. Now, I hope I'm not being loose with Scripture, but, and I'm not saying this in concrete, as I say so often, but this is just to tantalize your thinking. This is something to just mull over. After 2,000 years, after 2,000 years, he will revive us. Has he? Yes, the nation of Israel is coming back. They're coming back. They're back in Jerusalem. Oh, they're not spiritual yet by any stretch, but they're physically back in the land. All right, so that's after about 2,000 years. But now look at the next one. In the third day, or the third thousand years, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. What's that referring to? The kingdom. Now, that's the way I look at these verses. You may not agree with me, or you out on television may not agree with me, <clears throat> but I think this is the one inkling in Scripture that gives us a time frame. And that's another reason I think we are so close. We are so close to these 2,000 years since Christ's first advent that are over. And we're ready to be ushered into the next thousand years, which will be, of course, the kingdom. All right. Now we only got a few minutes left. Let's just stay with it as we've been on it. Here in uh, uh, Hosea, just go on to your next little book in the Old Testament. Yeah, Hosea, then Joel. Joel, chapter 3. Joel, chapter 3. Here again, we're going to have the horrors of the tribulation and then the glories of the kingdom. That's the process all through prophecy. First, Israel's demise, their punishment, invading armies, and then comes the blessings. And it's just a roller coaster, see? All right, now chapter 3 is looking all the way to the end time, to the end of these 2,000 years. Verse 2, where God says, I will gather all nations, and it is. It's going to be a coalition like George W. can't even dream about. It's going to be every nation involved. And they will be brought down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they, these Gentile nations, have scattered and parted my land. Sound familiar? What's the big problem in the Middle East? the West Bank, Gaza, Jericho. They've parted the land. That's why I sometimes just like to scream, don't give up one acre. It's Israel's. It's theirs. The whole book cries that it is. All right, here it is again. That's what they've done. They've divided God's land. Verse 3, they have cast lots for my people. They have given a boy for a harlot, sold a girl for wine. That's how Israel has been treated these last 2,000 years. Well, 
Let's go all the way down to the glories of the kingdom. Verse 17. So after all of their heartache and their sorrows and their murderings, now comes the kingdom. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. There shall no strangers pass through her. And it shall come to pass in that day, the mountain shall drop down new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with water, so a fountain shall come forth, and so on and so forth. Now, just drop over. Oh, we've got time, got a couple minutes. The next book is Amos. That can take us over to chapter 10. No, chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. And then they try to tell us that all of this has been thrown out. How can they? How can they? God's word is sure. It's going to happen. I'll guarantee it. Verse 13. For behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes will overtake him that sow a seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, the hills shall melt. I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink the wine there. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit, and I will plant them upon their land. And they, Israel, shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. All right, now I've got to get one more verse before we quit today, and I think we can do it in one minute. Keep turning to Zechariah. You're not that far away from it. Just keep turning through the little minor prophets and get to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14, and again, the first three verses are a picture of the final days of the tribulation, the horrors of it. And then in verse 4, we have Christ returning to the Mount of Olives as he left in Acts chapter 1. But now, you come all the way down to verse 8, and it shall be in that day when Christ sets up his kingdom that living waters shall go off in Jerusalem, half to the former and half to the hinder sea, that is the Mediterranean, out to the Dead Sea in summer and in winter it shall be. Now look at verse 9. Why, this is as plain as any third grader can understand. And the Lord, Jesus of Nazareth, shall be king over all the earth. Made it. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call one 800 369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.